Y'all better put him in the Heisman. Get the wood right here, baby. This is the Bud Light Seltzer Morning Rush Podcast. Bud Light Seltzer for those anytime easy drinking occasions. They're going to run and get that boot. The Arkansas Razorbacks have completed the dream season. A baseball team that's on the way back. A college world series title. The Bob Stadium. I almost got fired because I went Willie the boss after I had a little too much sauce. This is the Bud Light Seltzer Morning Rush Podcast. So we were talking about this proposed transfer rule a little bit in the first segment. Got a text in here from Brandon and said they should absolutely be allowed to transfer for any reason, plus to transfer for coaching changes. Things change a lot in the years. Sometimes they shouldn't be stuck with changes they didn't create. So there's a there's you got to look at it one way, you look at the other. There are some kids that are going to get to college and they're going to be very successful and potentially may even play a little bit, crack the rotation their freshman year. There's other kids that are get behind the depth chart. They're used to being the star of their high school, wherever they went, used to getting all the special treatment. They're not getting that, and they just feel like, oh, I need to transfer and stuff. Sometimes you just have to persevere and get through something. But sometimes so many obstacles get in your way, and like the coaching change that we mentioned with RJ, and uh, I can't remember the, the offensive line or the defensive lineman that was shifted to the offensive line in the first segment. I just want to know, Tommy, why do we hold – coaches like Mel Tucker, for example, who was at Colorado for one year and now Michigan State, why do we hold them to a separate standard than we do the players? Because they've been in the business 20 years and they're... That's they're, a cop-out, though. No, that's not a cop-out. They, they've they put their time in and they're far, much further along in where they're at in their career. It's, of course, a different uh, set of standards. It's that way everywhere in life. So what about, I mean, there's coaches all the time that like go from one job to one job to yeah. one job to one job. Like early on in their career, though. Right. If you, early on in their career. Mm-hmm. Okay. Early on in their career, just like young players. It's not – It's a. am not saying the standards are right, but you're asking why they do it. This is why they do it. it, it it's it's a job for them. It's what they, – they have already went through college, got their degree, put in their time so to get to this point. We're not in this – so, so, you, so they're supposed to stay at a school – We're asking the players for, to for, – no, I'm asking the players to say that they get this one-time transfer now, or that that's what's proposed. But you seem to be against it, right? I think it. I think there's going to be unforeseen. Just like we weren't, we weren't thinking about a senior that had not redshirted sitting out and saying, "You know, coach, I'm, I think I'm good. I'm not going to play this year." Mm-hmm. There are going to be loopholes on this thing we haven't even thought about that are going to affect the game, kind of like the Kelly Bryant situation. No, I don't think I'm going to play with the four-year or uh, four-game rule. There's there's things on this we haven't even considered yet that are going to create massive headaches in the sport. But at the end, of it's this- going to open up a wild, wild west. I'm I fear of free agency recruiting within the sport. And I think, to- and I just think it takes. I just think it has a little level of grime and dirt and just I don't know. Sleaziness isn't the right word, but just it adds impurity to college sport. It's, okay, that's done. If you if we think college football is pure in its current state, that's that's done and over with. It, but but this is another level. This is going a step further. Why do you think that? Just because of the? Do you think there'll be more incentive to? Oh, absolutely. To There's going to be more. Not not pay play. This is just more incentive for. So if you're Nick Saban and you're sitting at Alabama and you lose a guy because he has a career-ending injury, mm-hmm. and now he calls up your running back at Arkansas who hadn't used his transfer, hey, we could use you at Alabama, and he still has his transfer, and he's academically eligible, not on disciplinary suspension, and he leaves and goes to Alabama, your best running back for no good reason. How you going to feel about this rule then? Uh, well, yeah, that, that's what I'm asking. How do you feel about it? you got to ask yourself, are, Tommy, are you looking at it from the spe- perspective of Arkansas or are you looking at it from the perspective of the student-athlete in the NCAA? Because there's two different ones. Well, I'm looking at it from a fan perspective. Okay, that's a, and that's fine, and I, I agree with you on that. That's what I am. You know, I can't look at it from a student-athlete perspective because I'm not. Well, the NCAA is supposedly trying to look at it from that angle oh, because I get your horse bleep. Okay. I'm just telling you that's what that's what they're trying to at least put out there and have that well, yeah. presentation. But at the end of the day, this thing is fraught with a lot of perils that we haven't even considered that are possibilities. That's fair. 
And I think from just like the four game redshirt rule came with all sorts of things. Well, we didn't think about that when we when we voted this in. We didn't think a guy who had played three years without redshirting might come to his coaches and say, "You know what? I'm not going to play in game five. In fact, coach, I'm not going to play the rest of my career here because I'm going to leave." And go play my my senior year somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Well, we didn't think about that scenario. So, what scenarios are we not thinking about here? I, I don't know. And I get and your perspective. I think is correct in saying this would probably hurt more than it would help Arkansas. But I, I you I, you have to look at it from two different perspectives. Are you doing what's best for the NCAA? And I get like we're in Arkansas. We're all across Arkansas doing Ar- Arkansas sports radio. If someone could find me a scenario, if someone could find me a pathway where this helps Arkansas rather than hurts it, by all means, call in right now, 877-377-6963. I'm just coming from the perspective, Tommy, that if you're looking at it from the student-athlete and the entire NCAA college football as a whole, this is beneficial for the student-athlete. I get that, but I completely, I, I am not disagreeing you at all when it pertains to just Arkansas, just the Arkansas football, basketball, and baseball program. I don't know, and not really baseball. Baseball's going to be fine. Yeah, but yeah. if you look more... Not, go, I, not going to be very many that leave. Now, there will be some because they can't meet Dave Van Horn's standard. And I would actually argue this would be better for the Arkansas basketball program because Musselman's track record right. when it comes to transfers. But in terms of the football program, because of how your current co- head coach... And I'm not saying Sam Pittman couldn't adjust. All I'm saying is what he's done to this point is shown that he's built relationships I, from the ground up rather than... The quick fix, which must, I think, has shown the ability since arriving in Arkansas to do both with these high school kids he's got coming in and some of the transfers he bought it. So he can adapt to both. I'm not saying that Pittman can adapt, but I am saying that his track record shows that he's a lot better with developmental relationships than he is just transfers and stuff like that. I'm with you. I don't think this rule will be detrimental in any way for Arkansas baseball. I don't think it will be... I mean, neutral at worst for for basketball with your current coach. And what this is going to require is you better have good coaches. Now, you know, there will come a day Dave Van Horn is no longer your baseball coach. You may feel differently about all of this. Mm -hmm. That day's coming. Hopefully it's a decade away, 15 years away. I don't think he's coaching anywhere else in in the rest of his career. But there will be a day where he doesn't coach here anymore. We all understand that. But I'm going to tell you, this rule, coupled with the early signing period, coupled with it, has – Given Arkansas a lot of problems in rebuilding the program. We all get that, right? This this rule gets enacted, plus it's going to cause problems for, for Arkansas football. You're listening to the Bud Light Seltzer Morning Rush Podcast. Bud Light Seltzer, available in black cherry, strawberry, lemon, lime, and mango. Give is to Alex Collins, straight up the middle, and Collins on the run. They won't catch him. Alex Collins is going to take it all the way to the house. Touchdown, Arkansas. 80 yards. Got a text here, Tommy, from Hong Kong Sui talking about, and I don't now, I don't know about this being the best for kids allowing free agency. Sometimes the best thing for kids to learn is how to fight through adversity. No one has to do that more uh, anymore due to everyone getting the trophy in our society. And this Hong Kong Sui is where I bring up the fact that I am a millennial, but in a sense I'm not a millennial. I get that line of thinking. I understand that. I just think, like you said, like I, the coaches, like if you if you commit to a certain coach and he leaves, you should be allowed to leave, right? Is that fair? What, did you commit to the coach or did you commit to the school? See, people say they commit to the school, and I know like Arkansas kids inside the state, yes, to a certain extent, some of them have committed recommitted to Sam Pittman, but they're committed to the school. They're committed to the University of Arkansas. And you sign the waiver that says you're committed to the school, not the coach. In reality, though, you commit to the coach. Like, that's just how it is. Ask any... It's a package deal is the reality. But like, You're not okay. going to go to a school you don't want to go to just because the coach is there. And you're not going to go to a school and play for a coach you don't want to play for. What's the bigger it's deal, It's got to be a combination. What's the bigger deal? Who... It should think, be an easy answer. I, I think it's the school to a degree because it's got a geograph. I mean, you, you still look it back and like 90% of student athletes commit to a school within 300 miles of home. So that's still something. It isn't all about coach. You know, it's got to be a fit of those two things. It, it's 
50-50 or so. I don't know. I don't know what the breakdown is. It's not – and in which coach is it? Is it the head coach, the position coach, the coordinator? It's a combination of all of it. To say it's it's one is, is much larger than the other, I don't think it's true. It's It's got to be the perfect blend of all of well, it. Well, it's one over the other. I think if you ask most student-athletes, on, on if you want to say on the record, off the record, whatever, they would tell you they are more committed to their coach, whoever is recruiting him, the head coach or whoever, than the university. So are we going to start letting students leave because the wide receiver coach gets another job, the, their position coach? Because – how many of these kids commit to the position coach as much or more so than a head coach? Well, I just, uh, based on... I mean, where do we draw the line here? Okay, based on what I've heard from you this morning, you don't allow transfers whatsoever. So there has to no, be... No, 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 I didn't say that. I'm just saying, how where how far down this road are we going? I don't know, that's what I'm asking you. We're going to play our freshman year at one school and our sophomore year at another school and, and, and it just play four schools in four years? Is that where we're going to be in ten years? So what do you think? Like, let's say they put you in charge. Let's say they put you in Mark Emmert's position. How would you go about this? I don't have a problem in principle with the idea of a single transfer, and that's it. Now, can we draw the line there? You get to transfer once, and that's it. So no no longer grad transfer? Like, you can do what Detail Silla did, where he transferred so once third, and then grad transferred. That'd be a third school, perhaps, in your five years? Well, you only get five years to play. Yeah. You get four years to play five. So we're going to play at three schools in five seasons? I'm asking you. So Scylla would not, in, that, in in your world, Scylla would not be at the University of Arkansas right now. That that seems excessive to me to play at three schools in five years. Okay. Or three schools in perhaps four years. So you would be okay. Based- I don't think it sounds fundamentally fair to penalize a guy who got his college degree that couldn't transfer, but... It's going to be hard to be a – I'm going to tell you this. It'll be hard to be a graduate transfer if you've already transferred once before. I, okay. I think that would be difficult to do, but we saw Jimmy Witt do it. So Starkle would have I mean, to be – Jimmy Witt's an example of a guy that did. Yeah, Starkle would have to be here. Jimmy Witt would not be a Razorback. Uh, Dean Telsillo would not be a Razorback. Those are just some examples yeah. that are popping but, in but my mind at the They're moment. the exception, not the rule. Would you agree? There's not a lot of those guys running no. around that have yeah. transferred once already and then were able to transfer again because they were graduates. That's just hard to do. I mean, if you, I transferred schools in college once from from the local school where I grew up to Arkansas Tech, and not every not every college credit transferred. I mean, it, and I don't know how it is today because I haven't been in college in nearly 20 years. But that just in and of itself, as a student, forget the athlete part makes it difficult just to make sure all your credits transfer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that first transfer doesn't come without problems. And the the other part of this proposal is you got to leave your current institution academically eligible and not on disciplinary uh, suspension of any kind. The four stipulations, we'll go and go over these. You have to receive a transfer release from the previous school, leave the previous school academically eligible, what Tommy is talking about, maintain the academic progress at the new school, and then leave under no disciplinary suspension. So you can't get in trouble and then just say, oh, I'm done here. Yeah. Like, that's here, that's not going to work. I guess here, and, and again, we we see these proposals, we think about all the loopholes, but that's where I go is how would I take advantage of a rule if I'm sitting in a position as a head coach? And I'm telling you right now, if I'm Nick Saban or I'm I'm one of these top four or five, I, I'm Dabble Sweeney, I'm, you know, pick out whatever you think, I'm Lincoln Riley. You know, whoever you think are the top three, four, five, I'm Ryan Day, top four, five programs in college football. Mm -hmm. All right? And I all of a sudden, due to an injury, due to a transfer, due to whatever, I have a real deficiency in my two deep. I'm going to start trying to pluck the best players in my conference or around the country off someone else's roster. And I just think as an Arkansas fan, that has a great deal of liability. So would you be okay if it wasn't interconference? They t- if they added that little tidbit in there to well, the rule? Well, but that, I think that cuts the legs out of the whole reason why you, you want this thing. The whole reason this thing started is because you had guys like Nick Saban that were putting ridiculous restrictions on where someone could transfer to, even when you agreed to sit the year before they opened all of this up. Why did we get to where we're at? We got here because coaches said, well, you can't you can't go to any school in our conference or any school that's on our schedule or any school that, you know, 
basically can't go anywhere you want to go. Okay. And that's how we got to where we're at. And that's why we came up with a rule, no, student-athletes can go anywhere they want. Okay. And coaches don't have to sign off on it anymore. So you've put out a lot of the things that could happen, that might happen and stuff. And I'm, at, I'm, I'm, I'm like genuinely asking you, what would you do if you're Mark Emery? Would you keep it the same, or right. how would you change it when it comes to those five sports? First of all, Mark Emery won't decide. It will be the schools yeah. that vote, so let's remember that. Mm-hmm. But I, I think if I was casting a vote as a school, I would. I think I think the the pressure will be too great. This is going to pass in some form. This is going to move forward. Like the ninety five percent chance in some form, there may be some variations. The thing I'd like to see to this, and I don't know how you even regulate this, how you police it, is some kind of like no tampering clause. One school's not allowed to call an athlete at another school. I don't know how you regulate that. I think that's still in place. Like but, a, but making that clear cut. Okay. You know? I believe, because that, I don't know if they call it tampering, because that's more of an NBA or NFL yeah, term. It's, but it's a professional sports term. I believe you're not allowed to code, or you're not allowed to text but, a kid that's already. But you got a kid on your roster that played high school football with the kid over here. Hey, text your, you know, hey, John, text Tim, who's over here, and have him call. And you just think that would be, because that happens still today. We can't I, act I, like that doesn't, but you, you just know, think it would be more prevalent if you know, they went this way. I just think it, it opens up another opportunity and loophole for a lot of things. That, that One thing I'm mentioning here is coaches plucking players off rosters to, to fill needs on their current roster. What was one of the other reasons we changed some of these rules a few years ago, just a few short seasons ago, because coaches were were trying to find ways to basically purge the players off their roster they didn't want anymore, right? That this whole idea that your your scholarship was year to year, they didn't like that either, right? Well, this kind of didn't open that back up, but you know, if the coach can go to the kid at the end of the year, hey, you don't have to sit to go elsewhere. We really think you need to go play elsewhere. Mm-hmm. You're not going to play here. Do you hear me? You're not going to play here you need to transfer that's how they get rid of you know because we want to get rid of these seven kids and bring in seven more from some other source and and that's that was one of the reasons why we changed some of the rules and so coaches weren't purging kids off the roster just because they didn't turn out to be the kind of player they wanted 877-377-6963 Eight seven seven three seven seven six nine six three is the number call or text in ryan is in van buren ryan you're on the morning rush Hey, good morning. Good morning, guys. Hey, uh, you know, weighing in on this thing with this transfer, uh, you ask how it would benefit Arkansas. And I mean, I can understand losing like a Rakeem Boyd uh, in a situation, but even if we had that rule now, would Connor, would Connor Vanover be on the basketball court? Probably so. Um, but on the flip side, with that tampering, there's got to be a penalty there for those schools to prevent them from doing it. I mean, if a, if a Nick Saban somebody in his organization tampers with an arc with a player and they can prove it, will take scholarships away. Take stuff away. Make that penalty there to where it discourages that and, you know, because how many players that have are in Pittman's class that might not be able to be there, you know, it, as transfers if we just totally close it down. We we've got to have that ability. You know, but that's just that's kind of where I'm at. But that no tampering makes the penalty steep. And that's all I got, fellas. Yeah. I'll talk to you later. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, you Probably can't. Probably is proving all. You know, you're exactly right, but how do you prove all? You got text. Yeah, but you think the kids are going to necessarily turn that stuff over? Well, it depends on if you if Saban uses a burner phone or not. But that's <laughs> yeah. that's a that's. You got to remember, they don't have subpoena power at the NCAA. That's a that's a big issue on that. So, and, and Ryan brings up a good point. And we got we also have to think about from a sole Arkansas perspective. Like you, if you're looking at your fans' lens, this would I, I think in Dave Van Horn's case. Baseball, and again, you brought up the fact he's not going to be there forever. But where your baseball is in his current state right now, this rule's great. Because everyone, like, even kids that, like, get really good in another school, they're like, man, I, I, I want to spend my senior year yeah. playing for Arkansas, competing for a national championship. Well, basketball, Moss has the track record when it comes to recruiting kids that are transfers. It helps in basketball. But your moneymaker, your big dog, football, yep. where the football program is right now, and I'm not going to say that Sam Pittman can't get it back to a place where they're at least relevant in the SEC West, but where you are right now, 
if you do have a good player or whatever, there's a chance that he could be picked off the team. Yeah. It's like a better place. You trying to build back up a football program in the SEC West, in the toughest division, the toughest conference in college football, the addition to this rule could hurt you in the fact that when you're trying to build your program up, all of a sudden two or three of your best players come off the roster because they don't want to just try and get the program back up. They want to compete for a national championship. They want to compete and go to try and go to the college football yeah. playoffs. So that makes it that much more difficult. Would that happen 100%? I don't know, but I at least get your perspective on why you might think that would happen. This, this probably doesn't affect a, an in-state kid, kid that played high school football in Arkansas, a kid that grew up in this state, someone that grew up their whole life wanting to be a Razorback. This probably doesn't affect a kid like that. This is the kid that came from Texas, that, that played near Tyler or played in you know, somewhere in, in East Texas, that comes to Arkansas, and is a pretty good player. Now all of a sudden A and M would love to have his services. Hey, we'll give you an oil well. We'll give your granddaddy an oil well if you'll come play football at A and M. You know, and these things, you know, all of a sudden magically they're back closer to home, and granddaddy's got an oil well. You know, text here out of the five hundred one. Tommy saying you have a you're having your boomer moment. We need to face sounds the fact, like something my ten year old would say. We need to face the fact that college sports is being treated as the semi pro league for professional levels. I'm not saying these kids need to get paid, but they do have the mobility to go where they can't concede. And you brought up the fact that the coaches were in this in this league as a business. In reality, this is a business for the players as well. Now, I'm not, I, I don't want to get into the pain aspect of this right now because I don't want to go on that diatribe. But if you're going to say it's about the coaches, you, if one of the excuses you're saying, well, the coaches is a business. It's just as much a business for the players, even though they want to call it student-athletes today. The, the players have a limited window. They get five years to play four, and you don't want to, you know, you mess around and, and screw up more than about two of those years. Your opportunity to play for money is very limited. But, you know, again, the percentages of players that actually go play in the NFL is still very, very small. So we're making a rule that, that affects 100%. Professionally, how many? What, what's the percentage? It's like less than five percent yeah, of the players small. go go to play in the NFL. Right. Now, you mentioned this is semi pro football. Let's think about it. Now there is semi pro football, right? It's actually a little more than semi pro XFL, and they don't have the restrictions. I think this is another interesting thing. The XFL didn't have the restrictions on you got to be out of high school three years to enter their draft. Mm -hmm. Well, we see some players that would be college football players. They might go play in the XFL at some point rather than college football. That'd be a great risk, particularly if that league doesn't survive and then you'd be kind of stuck holding the bag. But I think you'll see a player at some point leave college early to go play in the XFL with the hopes of getting to the NFL. So, you know, minor league baseball, the farm system, that's what they call it. Yep. Um, Ricky Murphy, Texas, brings up, and he's talking about something Trey Biddy wrote that the unintended con consequences like top 10 programs would just use smaller schools. And I don't know if Arkansas falls in this category, but it's a farm system. When someone gets really good, they come calling. So I, I get that. And, again, you, you, you either look at it from the student-athlete perspective or the Arkansas football lens. The Arkansas football lens tells you that this would probably be a rule that would hurt and hinder the Razorbacks rather than help. Yeah, yeah. I mean, And that's the only lens I'm – looking at players are going to come and go the football program that we love that we'll die for is going to be here forever that's what we we are so sick and tired of two win seasons four win seasons we are so sick and tired of being everybody's doormat we don't need another rule that's going to make it harder to get back to relevancy and we all thought this early signing period was going to be a wonderful deal it's been a real pain in the you know what for arkansas because it starts out at the time you bring Chad Morris in. We've had two lost classes as a result. Well, that's not necessarily. That early signing period has been a thorn in the side of Arkansas. That's because you had a terrible coach who didn't know what he was doing. No, it's been because you've, tra you've transitioned with two different coaches with this early signing period, and, and you've lost classes as a result because you were down to, what, eight commitments when Sam Pittman arrived on campus? Three commitments? That was three. Maybe Whatever it was. Too many. I mean, but that's the only reason you're saying that, Tommy, is because you've transitioned coaches. You don't necessarily know if that will help or hurt Sam Pittman moving forward 
that. You're, and I, I get that. Because we haven't know. seen a coach last long enough during this era of early signing period to know. We just know that it's a hell of a deal to be changing coaches in, in today's era of college football. If you're one of the mid to lower tier programs in your conference, it's a it's a hard thing to do. And I, I'm going to tell you, it's a consideration for an AD and a and a chancellor. Well, do we want to pull the trigger on this guy, or do we want to do it like Mississippi State did? We'll just wait till after the bowl game with Joe Moorhead. <laughs> you know, we'll just do it then after everybody signed. I'm trying to go back through my mind and, and remember if Sam Pittman has, has spoken to if he likes or doesn't like the early signing period. We asked him here on the show uh, whenever he was on a month ago or whatever, and you know it, it raised the level of difficulty. There's no question. But is that just difficulty for him in Arkansas or is that yes. difficulty across the board? Well, I mean, do you care about across the board? Well, Matt, you, well, I just care about Arkansas. Well, you can either have it hurt Arkansas a little bit and hurt other teams a lot or it hurts Arkansas a lot and hurts other teams a lot. Well, I think it helps the big and mighty. I think it helps the Alabamas and the LSUs because it, 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 it also helps Arkansas in this way. But it, 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 it hurts because it takes all the best players off the board and now you can't touch them. You, you had a new coach on the job this, this year, been here days. And then the best players are gone ten days later or whatever, mm-hmm. twelve days later. Can't can't touch them. Eighty percent of college football signees are gone, but at least it lets you know the twenty or twenty five percent that remain of who's who's. You don't waste any time on these other guys that are committed somewhere else that you probably won't get anyway. Okay. It lets you know where you stand with everybody. That's the one good side effect of the early signing period is if you come in a situation like Sam Pittman did this year, you're not wasting time on kids that signed an early commitment because you know there ain't no sense in wasting time on him he's signed with lsu and i think just because you don't like something doesn't mean you can't be successful in it like i don't necessarily like waking up at 4 20 in the morning but that doesn't mean we can't have a successful sports radio talk show mm-hmm. and that's just that's part of it i know that you've been doing this a lot longer and it's just accustomed to you i'm i don't mean i like it though yeah that's what that's what i'm saying that just because you don't like something doesn't mean you can't be successful in it. And when you brought up the early signing period, I know we've been talking about football, but if you look at the basketball side of things, your four guys that you're bringing this 2020 class, three of them hadn't signed yet. And I know that they're locked in. All you ever hear about Arkansas, Arkansas, Arkansas from Moses Booty, Jalen Williams, and K.K. Robinson. But until you see that pen to paper, until you see these guys sign those national signing letters, until you get those in, regardless of what they say, you don't rest easy. You don't rest it. easy. I yeah. guarantee you that Eric Musselman is excited as about these kids supposedly coming to the hill. There's always that that bleak thought in the back of his mind: what happens if something just out of the blue comes out of there and something? And that's what the early signing period does. You got one guy in Devonte Davis who's early signed during the early signing period. Does that necessarily mean? That the football team, when Sam Pittman has a full recruiting cycle, is going to be able to get all his guys in the early starting period. I don't know, and I don't. And again, you, it, it makes it more difficult. But you at least lock those guys down, and hopefully, we won't have a coaching transition period sometime That's, in the next is. couple of years where that kills yeah. a recruiting class like it has the last two years. Lack three of years. stability is, and this new proposal we're talking about this morning would be just another penalty, if you will. Because then if you have another transition in any program, there's the, the, the likelihood of mass exodus would be far more likely, right? You can transfer with basically no penalty as long as you're eligible mm-hmm. and in good standing. The, I mean, what would the roster look like at Arkansas? Let's just say this rule had been in place a year ago. Six months ago, whatever, mm-hmm. before Chad Morris was fired, what would what would Sam Pittman's roster look like when players could just basically, with, with without penalty, move to another school before they even knew who the next head coach was going to be? I don't remember who brought this up when Mike Norvell decided he was going to take the job at Florida State. What would have happened if he just brought his ten best Memphis players with him? Because again, mm-hmm. I'm under the impression you you kind of think different, but I think it's coach above school. And so if I'm right, which I don't know if I am or not, it's going to be hard to determine that. And those players will fall coaches. That's what ha- I mean. That's what happens well, in recruiting classes. There were SMU kids that were committed to SMU. They fell fall Chad Morris to Arkansas. So that's also something to think about. You know what it and, is above coach and school. Playing time. 
Yeah, I'd, I'd probably say that's that's up there. Playing time's a big issue, and that's what did Chad Morris talk about when he was recruiting kids here. What did we recruit? What yeah. was the heaviest hitter that we used in our arsenal? Availability. Playing time. You're listening to the Bud Light Seltzer Morning Rush Podcast. Bud Light Seltzer, gluten-free with no artificial flavors. Now he does a tight roll back. Boy, Houdini's in the house. We're at number three, and nobody's home to watch that house. Touchdown, Hogs! Holy Hogs! Welcome in the man, Richard Davenport of the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. Richard, good morning, man. How are we on this uh, Thursday? Doing well, buddy. Doing well. First question fired off from Bill in Fayetteville, Richard, is asking about Ebony Jackson. I know with the addition of Xavier Kelly, he's no longer going to be part of the equation. Can you update on the status and kind of what transpired with Ebony Jackson, Richard? Well, I mean, uh, obviously he was he was still committed to him uh, after signing day. They, they just wanted to uh, uh, to see how he de- uh, he. I guess uh, I did uh, during the spring uh, semester, and uh, and if things went well, you know they could possibly take him. Right now, like you said, uh, uh, with uh, Xavier Kelly, that's uh, that's that takes care of the twenty five for the uh, for the twenty twenty class. And right now, you'd, you'd probably lean towards if anything if, if, if there's any chance of ebony coming on it would probably be if 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 arkansas wanted to go forward it would let him he'd, he'd probably have to just set out uh next uh next fall the first semester and come in as uh as a 2021 guy do you think this proposed rule that the ncaa has put out when it comes to one-time transfers Richard, do you think it would hurt and have more harm or help Arkansas when it comes to the football program? Well, I tell you what, it's a tough one. It really is. I just, I just, you know, some people make some good points that, uh, you know, say uh, some kids at Alabama or Georgia or whatever that are sitting on the bench and they're a little impatient. Which, you know, that's that's a that is something that uh, kids are nowadays, definitely. But uh, that they they look elsewhere and just you know look to transfer and you know a school like Arkansas could you know snatch them up. Uh, I get that, uh, but at the same time it can come back and bite you too. So uh, it's 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 going to be an interesting situation. How it all uh, pans out, I don't know. I, all I know is that uh, last year that about twelve to thirteen hundred kids transferred uh, in basketball. Yeah, and that that is you know most of them sitting out a year. What happens if uh, mm-hmm. you know this passes through? Does, does it double or triple? And I think that that's very possible because there was there were kids this year, even before the season started, entered the portal, uh, which is mind boggling to me. But uh, I, I, you know I understand that they're trying to make. Uh, the NCAA is trying to make it more friendly to, towards the athletes, but at the same time, I, I don't. I just don't know if uh, this is the right direction. You know, that's the thing. the The four year or the four game red shirt rule they put in a couple of years ago. They weren't even thinking about loopholes like we saw with Kelly Bryant. Hey, by game four, I coach. I think I'm. I'm not going to play my senior year. I'm going to. I'm going to transfer. There are certain loopholes that we haven't even thought of yet. Certain ways this rule could be used, and uh, you, you think you're putting a rule in place uh, to benefit uh, everyone, and then you realize well, we've opened up and created this whole other possibility here that we hadn't even thought of yet. And, and those are the things I think that, that, that make coaches and administrators nervous: is what what Pandora's boxes are we opening here that we hadn't even thought of, Richard? No, you're right, Tommy. I agree with you. I mean, that's it, it's the same thing with. Uh... You know, the, uh, allowing the uh, the athletes to uh, benefit, uh, off, you know, off of their name, uh, their likeness, or whatever. Uh, I it, I think the NCA is uh, is going into in some areas that uh, we, we we really don't know what the outcome is going to be. And uh, I just tend to think uh, if if you allow kids to to transfer one time, I mean, even the basketball guys. Uh, 
uh, there were several of them going on their second and third third school within a you know about a two three year period. So it's it's uh, I I don't know I don't know it's it's it, we truly don't know all the all the uh, all the all the things that you're talking about that could possibly come true. You know things that we don't know. That are, are thinking about right. I mean, but you think about a player like Connor Vanover, who would be eligible to play and to benefit uh, from playing this year to help the team. Uh, you think about maybe the outcome of of some of these razor thin games that Arkansas has lost by a handful of points. A player like Connor Vanover, who didn't get the waiver, while other players in similar situations with the NCAA did. You think, well, there's there's not equity or fairness in the current setup, so we just let everyone have a one year transfer. Well, what about then a Jimmy Witt, who is a great? We still allow graduate transfers, you know, and it's back to Arkansas and it's technically third school in his five seasons. So, I mean, it, it, there's just a lot of things to think through, but I think it it also allows for some fairness by just saying, all right, everybody gets gets one ace, if you will, one 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 ace card up their sleeve. No, you're exactly right, and and, and I get that. That, that you, I mean, you look at Connor, and, and you look at some of the guys that uh, that did get waivers, and, and you're just you just scratching your head. Uh, it, it, I think it's pretty. I think the NCAA is trying to get out of that, and and try to get out of the controversy of uh, when they they do give waivers and they, when they don't give waivers, and having try to you know explain that, uh, but. Uh, yeah, it's uh, we're definitely going into some uh, uncharted territory, and I guess probably two or three years we'll, we'll kind of have a better idea of uh, how it all pans out. And I'm sure they'll, they'll probably try to tweak things as things go along. But uh, it, like you said, with the uh, four game red shirt rule, I mean, I, they, I don't think they had any clue that, that that you know kids would start utilizing that in, in the way that they are. Recruiting expert Richard Davenport with us on the Morning Rush. Richard, this comes from Pablo in Kansas City. He's asking if the Hogs re-offered Landon Jackson, the the Texas Five Star. No, and if, as far as I know, they have not just yet. Uh, I noticed that he's uh, setting up uh, two official visits to Texas and Texas A and M. So, uh, you know, I'm sure that the, the they I'm sure that they know about him and uh, that they'll. They'll get on him uh, fairly quickly. Uh, I really don't have a, a, a good answer on that. So, Richard, with the, with the transfers that they've brought in with Xavier Kelly, Felipe Franks, Levi Draper, Reed, I think there's one of the kicker from Duke, and I think there's one other guy that I might be mentioning. Looking, and I know you don't cover recruiting nationally, but as far as that stacks up to other colleges, not only the SEC, but across college football, that, that has to be pretty high up there, right? The caliber of guys they were able to recruit, bring in but just from other schools. No, I, 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 I would tend to think it's one of the better uh, graduate halls uh, in the country. I mean, uh, let's face it, Arkansas needed a quarterback. They got one. They got a proven SEC quarterback. They brought in a – now, we don't know how Xavier Kelly's going to be uh, because he didn't really play a lot at, at Clemson, but you, you uh, obviously had one of the better uh, defensive line uh, lines uh, the last few years at Clemson, so uh, you, you could see where a guy that uh, maybe had the ability to see the field just didn't see the field as much as that, uh, you know, as he could maybe at, say at Arkansas or someplace like that. And then I think with the kicker AJ Reed, I mean, he, he was very successful uh, at uh, Duke. Uh, good time in there. Uh, you need you needed a good corner, and everything that you hear about Jerry Jacobs is that uh, he he was a very very solid corner at uh, Arkansas State. So uh, they, I think they probably did as well or better than anybody in the country for his graduate transfers. Yeah, Richard, we were debating earlier during the show whether kids commit to coaches or kids commit to schools, and and we know there's obviously some that do both. But you talk to these kids, and we were talking about it from this transfer rule perspective what do you think the percentage is if you had to tab it uh what percentage commit to a coach and what percentage commit to a school which which way do you think it is i think the majority of it is the, is the coaches now uh because you, you you develop those relationships uh over a year or two and that that's that's why you have so many kids get upset when a coach leaves or 
or their position coach leaves. Uh, then, then you have kids that go to school, say LSU, because of, uh, say if you're a defensive back, uh, what they've done with defensive backs over the years is probably on par with anybody in the country. So a lot of times kids will, will go to a school that produces, uh, professional athletes at their particular position. So, uh, but I, I would say definitely, uh, the, the relationships with the coaches are, is probably number one. Richard, before we let you go, man, is there any other football updates? Is there any other basketball update, a big time baseball that you think that the listeners of ESPN Arkansas should know about? Well, I mean, obviously this is a dead period for football and, and then, uh, uh, the first weekend that they're going to have kids for unofficial visits is March 7th. Uh, you already have some kids saying that they're going to, they, they plan to visit, uh, on March 7th. So that's going to be the next big recruiting weekend for football. For basketball, really just waiting for April the 15th, uh, for, uh spring signing period and, and sign the, uh, three unsigned, uh, kids that are committed to them. But, uh, really nothing, uh, really big right now. Richard Davenport of the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, also Whole Hog Sports, our recruiting expert on a recruiting Thursday. Richard, as always, appreciate you carving out some time for us, man, and uh, we'll speak to you next week. All right, Todd. Take care, buddy. We'll see you. Later, buddy. I'm, go ahead. All right, so Richard Davenport yeah. brought to you by Burton Pools and Spas, your source for backyard fun. In-ground pools, semi-in-ground pools start at less than 10 thousand dollars right now so if you've always dreamed of an in-ground pool in your backyard or having a pool in your backyard but you don't want to break the bank they've got options for you right now at burton pools and spas you can get semi in-ground pools for under ten thousand dollars stop in and see the award-winning team that can design your backyard design your pool then the award-winning teams that come out and construct it will impress you so much. So Springdale and Fort Smith are the places to go. That's Burton Pools and Spas on Zero Street in Fort Smith and just off I-49 at the 412 exit in Springdale. Burton Pools and Spas, your source for backyard fun. So when we went through the hiring process together and you were debating on if you were going to hire me or not, would you believe me if I told you that I picked you and not the company? No, absolutely not. Okay. <laughs> I, I will say that uh, some previous employees that worked here spoke very highly of you really and spoke you. spoke great things about you. <laughs> so I, I I don't know if I was the ultimate reason. I, I say I decided, but you basically decided if my employment was going to be granted here or not. But it was your begging and groveling yeah, that, uh, just, that that won you the job. It was uh, please. It was the, it was the arts too. Please. Wade uh, Wade sold me over there, but I will say that that. You you did have a big impact coming there because I have had some some employers in the past that weren't up to snuff. Mm -hmm. So that's I think you can parallel that to the coaching in a sense. And I'm not say I'm not going to say I won the argument because the recruiting expert that we have no, on every exactly Thursday. That's why you're bringing this up is you want to <laughs> gloat that you think you listen, have won an argument. Listen, here. listen. I don't win many arguments here because every time I'm winning an argument, you thread my job, which we can just. <laughs> By the way, that's a complete joke. If you guys didn't pick up on that, we like, for example, me and me and Matt and everyone else here tried to unionize, and Tommy just nipped that in the bud right away. And I'm, again, another joke. Don't take us to one day. Yeah, don't take us. What's the what's who you report that to? If uh, whatever, if like someone doesn't grant a union or whatever, I'm complete. By the way, that is complete fabrication. I'm completely, <laughs> I'm completely kidding about yeah. that. Someone so, out there with the AFL, CIO, yeah, something or another is so, uh, filing paperwork as we speak. I yeah. have. Uh, I actually like. I, I like my job, and there's not. And there, oh, well, I say there's nothing to really want to change about. Nothing and to note. Put that on a DFR form. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, the reason I brought that up is because Richard said that. So I just I wanted, but but that I mean that is a good point. So I think with Arkansas, there's a difference, Tommy. With Arkansas kids, and this is it for everyone. Most Arkansas kids that want to go to Arkansas, they don't really care who the coach is. They just want to be a racer back. Now, some coaches are really good recruiters. They really know how to bring kids in. They can bring the the home homegrown aspect. They can bring the the sit and talk with family stuff. They're just good at that. Some coaches aren't necessarily, that's not their strength, and yet these kids still end up in Arkansas, whether it's football, whether it's baseball, whether it's basketball. Baseball, you haven't had a problem with that, obviously, because you've had two tremendous coaches. Basketball, some cases you've had good coaches, some cases you hadn't. Football, the same way, but you haven't had really any good coaches lately. I think it just, it's all, it also depends on the situation, also depends on the kid. I just think a, a kid in-state is a lot more likely to commit to the school 
being he's growing up around the University of Arkansas than a kid out of state who I think would be more likely right. to commit to the coach. And about where do half of Arkansas's recruits come from? In state, right? Right. And I said about half of them commit to the school, right? Yeah, something like we're, we're going just, back. I think you just made my argument. We're going back to what <laughs> we're going back to what Richard said. That Richard Richard agreed with me. No, hey, it's a blend listen. of all of it. I mean, no, I know you would never go to play for a coach at a school you hated, nor would you play for a school with a coach you hated. It's got to it's got to all be there. I mean, you're, we're we're splitting frog hairs here. I think okay, so it was it was Bubba. I think, but, that, I, but we do know this. There is no doubt that most most kids, not all, but a vast majority of kids. Go to a school, select a school within 300 or so miles of where they played high school football. And that's why it's important. And this is why Rick Jones leaving for Missouri is, I don't know, necessarily call it detrimental. You, what did you compare it to? Nick Saban leaving the West? Oh, absolutely. I mean, Rick Jones leaving high school football for, for the 6A and for that conference. And this doesn't apply to to every school. I mean, this doesn't affect you if you're a 2 or 3 or 4A school or even particularly, and I guess it does to a degree, the 7A schools, because they play some non-conference games. But for that conference and that school, this is every bit, maybe even bigger. I mean, we're talking about a guy that was in 11 state championship games in 16 years. Trust me, I, I, know, the, I know the bad end of that, Tom. Right. <laughs> that's, that's Saban-esque numbers, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, no, th- th- this is every bit. The, you know, this is the day that we all dream about that Saban retires from Alabama. Now we may we could maybe win the West. Some of these schools that can't jump in there that aren't LSU or Auburn, maybe we can jump in there. Well, I guarantee you, there's schools in that league that now think maybe we can jump in there. I've been on the just as big a deal. I've been on the worst end of two of the best high school coaches in the state: Kevin Kelly at Pulaski Academy and Rick Jones at Greenwood in the revenge game. The revenge game that took place in 2007 when we pasted them at home like 44 to seven, and they just whooped us in the state championship. And then last year... You went to when, Little Rock Christian, for yes, those that don't know. correct. And then last year, uh, or two years ago, Little Rock Christian won a state championship against PA with Justin Hill doing what he did, and then they just creamed us in the state championship this past year, even though we beat him in the regular season. So revenge games are not fun. But the point I was originally going back to is the fact that Rick Jones being as good of a high school coach in this state, and I, like I love Arkansas high school football. I've been on the record saying that. I haven't been to a game in a while, but I enjoyed watching it growing up and and stuff, but it's just not the same level of caliber. And so, what makes as, good players at SEC schools? Arkansas high school football is not the same level of SECs like in those states. All of them? I mean, Tennessee football isn't great. It's better. I mean, it's better than every single state by capita recruiting. I mean, they may may, may have more numbers, but I, I, I couldn't go with it. Tennessee high school football isn't. It's a lot better than it used to be, and it's better in Arkansas. Mm, Look at the numbers. Mm, I don't know. I mean, I mean, the numbers show that. And then, the other thing to remember, I mean, I'm not sitting here saying Arkansas is on par with Texas or Georgia or Florida. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're not sitting here having that argument. But, I mean, I don't know that it's the worst in the league. I wouldn't it's go lower. there. I mean, you could ask Kentucky. I wish you have asked you. It's worse than Kentucky. Write there's that 13, down for next week, man. There's 13 players uh, that are NFL players from Kentucky, Maybe. and that's not justifying. There's are only you looking at one, one year? Or are you no, looking over the wall? Over the, I, I don't know. As of late, that's how it's been. Most of the athletes inside the state are playing basketball. That's why the basketball talent has been so flourishing lately. But, I mean, if that if that hurts to say coming out. I don't wish that was the no, case, no. but that's the case. I don't think over the long haul, though, that's – that's the way it is. And it that's has fair. been lately. But it has been but lately. I'm going to tell you, there's some other states that, now, obviously, Georgia and Texas and Florida are the, are the three best states in the conference footprint for putting out talent. Yeah. I don't think Arkansas is last on the list. You can also, I mean, it, it, it depends on, like, what are you asking? What are you looking at? Number of recruits that the state produces. Number, number of number of Division One Power for FBS. Are we talking okay. Power 5 commitments do you have coming out of your state? Well, so as far as four and five stars are, I looked this up last year. Arkansas is the last in that. Well, I mean, Maybe in one year, yes. But, I mean, I'm not looking at just in a one-year perspective. It depends on if you looked over the past 20 years, you looked over the past five. Arkansas sure. football is just down relative to where it's high school-wise it's been. Yeah. I mean, you think about certain schools that used to be powerhouses, it's just not the case anymore. This is something on BannerSociety.com, and it's the <clears> – <throat> 
50 states in D.C. ranked by the 2020 Blue Chip Recruits. Obviously, we talk, you said Florida and Texas. Florida's number one with 59, Texas at 54. You brought up Tennessee. They had 11, and Arkansas has two. Yeah. I mean, it's, what a good year this year. Uh, I'm saying over the long Let's see. Hole. You got the kid. How many Kentucky I have? Think, State of Kentucky. I think Terry Wells is the kid out of win that's just jumped in 24-7, top 300. You have Dray Norwood out of Fort Smith North Side. That's a top 250 kid. He plays either quarterback or safety. Um, so there's a couple still uh, coming up. We'll see what happens in the future. Your number one source of local news and information you need. Bud Light Seltzer, 5% ABV and only 100 calories. We put it up against any other seltzer out there.